Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly for October 13th, 2020. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is our weekly webcast and podcast where we talk about all things organized, and we go to all of the comments that you make on our social media channels to find out what you're going to talk about, and that's exactly what we did today. So, Get ready to get your questions answered. If you are joining us in Zoom for the first time, you can share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to another topic. If you're in Zoom, you can use the raise hand feature to let us know that you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. We're streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can also share your questions and suggestions there and I'll relay them to Gail. And during the live webcast each Tuesday, you can talk to us directly by calling 669-900-6833. Use meeting ID 993-419-863 to join the meeting. And the password is clutter. And the password is clutter. Okay, so speaking of clutter, what we're <laughs> gonna talk about today is just what is clutter anyway? You would think that after having meetups for 11 years we probably would have already <laughs> we would have figured it out by now <laughs> worked that out a youtube viewer this is inspired by a youtube comment a youtube viewer wrote to us to ask a very thought-provoking series of questions i have been decluttering lately but i still have a question is decluttering a phenomenon that is simply a matter of style for instance in the victorian era the prevalent decor was a cluttered one by our standards were the Victorians hampered by their surroundings? Is clutter defined by mess or can it be organized and still be called clutter? Another question is, if initially we acquired all those things in the first place, was there not some need for them? Why were they not initially clutter? I'd like to understand decluttering before maybe unnecessarily getting rid of stuff. I'd appreciate feedback. So that's a great question that raises a lot of points that we can talk about today. And so that's where we're going to focus. Are there things that are objectively clutter or is clutter simply a matter of style? So Victorians definitely covered every surface with tchotchkes and fancy decor and things on the wall and things on all of the surfaces. And of course, everything had a doily underneath it hence our background today. Uh, by today's aesthetic standards, most people would see it as clutter now, but of course it was in vogue then and that was the style. The dictionary definition of clutter is things in an untidy or disorganized state, but the dictionary neglects to tell us what untidy or disorganized means, so let's talk about what is clutter. Some things we can all probably agree are clutter right off the bat. If you have trash around your house that's not in a trash can, then I think we can agree that's clutter. So random paper on the floor, open shipping containers and wrapping from around products, food and drink containers that were left behind where they were consumed. Um, I, what, what comes to mind is the juice box that your little kid left behind and the soda can container that your um, you know son left in front of the game <laughs> the game machine as he was playing on the television. Um, any kind of, I ate this and I left the stuff sitting where I ate it instead of getting it all the way back into the kitchen. That um, I think we can all agree is clutter. But then after that, I think it gets a little bit more subjective and um, from a point of reference, whether it's clutter or not. And so you might define clutter as what about the tool with the frayed power cord, that was the one example that it came up with, that things that are broken or that you're unwilling to fix, if you are unwilling because you don't have the time or you are not able to fix it because of the cost to fix it or because you don't have the skill to fix it, then the fact that it could be fixed and still used doesn't change the fact that for you, it's clutter. If you're not able to fix it, if you're not willing to fix it, then the fact that it could be recovered really doesn't matter in your universe because in your universe, it's clutter. You might define clutter as things that affect your health and safety. So you may have useful items laying around, but any kind of excess that turns those things into a hazard or makes it difficult to clean around them, then it's starting to become clutter. So. The extreme example, of course, is here's a, a house of someone who has hoarding 
tendencies. Their house is going to be really, really full. It's going to be difficult to walk. It's going to be difficult to maneuver. The things may be taller than them and unstable and might be trying to fall on them. Um, it might be dirty because you can't actually get around to clean anything. And so in that environment, in that extreme example, the stuff in the house is affecting your health and safety, but it can also be something as minor as you have started putting things on the stairs to take up stairs. <laughs> but what that really means is you just park a bunch of stuff on the stairs. And if you then cover up several or all of the steps um, partially all the way up so that it's difficult for you to walk up and down the stairs safely, then that really is clutter on a minor scale because it affects your, it's not safe for you to run up and down the stairs if you uh, have given yourself 10 inches or 12 inches to navigate. Um, so that's an example of, a, a smaller example of affecting your health and safety. I also consider things in this category, you fill up the hall the, and the hallway is full of stuff that you have to run around and what happens when there's a fire and you have to escape and you can't navigate down the hallway or there's a bunch of things laying on the floor and if you step on them those things might slip around and you could slip and fall so it doesn't have to be that the house looks like a house of a, someone with hoarding tendencies it doesn't have to be that person's house for it to affect your health and safety it can be something much more minor that can get in the way of you safely navigating around inside your house. And if that's true, I think the stuff, you know, the piles on the floor, the stuff in the hallway, the stuff on the stairs, those are all clutter in that context. You might define clutter as things that cause you pain or grief. So things that you don't want to be reminded of, but you keep them out of a sense of obligation or responsibility. Sometimes your sentimentality about things has you keep things that are actually causing you grief while you have them. When the objects are just there because you can't face dealing with them, or they remind you of a horrible time in your life, or it's they're associated with something that is so distressing that you don't even want to look at the objects, then clearly you don't want to use the stuff, clearly you don't want to interact with the stuff, and then whatever use they might have gets negated by the fact that you are not willing to interact and deal with them. And so then it becomes clutter. And it, and actually it's clutter that's making you unhappy. <laughs> so <laughs> I think uh, whether this is stuff that you've inherited from a loved one, so it's grief and it reminds you of the person who is deceased and it makes it hard to let go of it, but also to face it. That's one version of that. The other version might be, here's the stuff that's left over from the divorce. So this is all of the wedding china from the husband that you no longer are married to. Here is the wedding dress comes up a lot of times when somebody's divorced. Here's my wedding dress. Well, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> Here is wedding gifts that came into the house that at one point were super precious and now just make you angry when you look at them. Clearly, those didn't start out as clutter, but because of a life event and a life change, they have become clutter to you because you don't want to look at them anymore. You don't want to think about them anymore. And so that is um, a way that it causes you pain and suffering and turns itself into clutter because of that. Another one is here's the leftovers from the job that you quit or got fired from or retired from and you bring all that stuff home from the job and then looking at them um, makes you sad or makes you overwhelmed or makes you miss work or makes you relive the experience of being fired and how painful that was and so all of those experiences are now attached to that pile of stuff and while you're looking at it you're thinking about something traumatic and it makes it hard to process it and it makes it hard to use the stuff and it it makes the stuff turn into clutter for you hopefully as we work on this stuff and 
get through it and get past it, it can, some of it can be reclaimed, some, some of it can be passed on. It doesn't have to stay clutter, but in the moment while you are looking at it and it's a pile and you feel pain and grief looking at it, it is clutter for you. You might define clutter as uh, when the things in the house are in such a disarray that it keeps you from actually finding what you want when you want it. So if you know that you own fill in the blank, but you can't put your hands on it, then it means that whatever the piles are have become clutter because they're in disarray. And you might be able to de-scrambleize them, reclaim the objects, find a home for the things that you want to keep and be able to find them and then they can be reclaimed from being clutter. But while they're in that state of disarray where you can't find anything, then those things are um, clutter to you. Or you may have so much stuff, even if it's really organized in some way, even if you've made an attempt to have it be organized, if you have so much that you can't find anything or you can't remember in some general way what you actually own, then it really has become clutter because it's the fact that it's organized still doesn't allow you to put your hands on it when you need it to remember that you own it to know that you have found everything that you own and so being organized in a way that you're okay with living in it with it is one thing you may live with the disarray and be comfortable with that but that organized disarray can still be clutter if you can't find what you own when you need it. I know a lot of people that function by deciding to go shopping when they need something. So the fact that they already own seven of them doesn't matter because they can't put their hands on the seven that they own. So they go back to the store and buy what they need so that they have it fresh in their hand right in that moment. And then as soon as they let go of it, it becomes part of the sea of clutter that they can't find. <laughs> so that level of disarray that some of us are comfortable living with is still clutter if you can't find what you need when you need it. Gail, I'm going to jump in with a comment from okay. Rowan. Who's okay. watch, Rowan is watching on Facebook and said, Hi, Rowan. maybe talk about people not wanting or noticing that they have changed and their life has changed. And I think that arises a lot in the previous point you covered about things that cause you pain and grief. Mm -hmm. They may be things that force you to confront a change that you haven't been ready to acknowledge. Yeah. And there's the very obvious example of the, I will never fit in <clears throat> size such and such <laughs> pants again. <laughs> right? Darn it. And you don't want to face the fact that you're um, unwilling or unable due to health, um, do the things that you need to do to get to size fill in the blank ever again. And that's and, sort of two kinds of clutter because it's both, yeah. that meets two of our definitions. It's no longer useful. Yeah, because you can't wear it. And, uh, and it is also causing you pain and grief. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, and I think um, it, there's these negative changes that have taken place, like I can't wear those clothes anymore, or I am now a widow, or I am now a divorcee, or I am no longer employed at that company, which are negative changes. But then there's also more positive changes, like I have married somebody different. I have moved to a new city. I live in a new apartment. I you know, used to live with small children, and now I am an empty nester. And so there are other major life changes that are more positive or thrilling or welcome to you that change what is okay to stay, right? So what you keep in your house when you are raising small children in the house is different than what you keep in the house when you are now an empty nester and you're taking care of dogs instead of children. And so the, there is definitely a shift in the useful contents of your house while as your life and your um, 
purpose and your existence evolves over time. That's 100% true. And, and we don't often, or we end up living with clutter that we don't discard as we change our lives around, as things get different about who we are and what we do. And we don't usually include you know, you work really hard towards positive changes and you put a lot of effort into it, but we don't usually um, consider circling back and discarding the old life support, the items that are part of your old life. You don't get rid of them as part of the process as you're changing necessarily. And it's a good thing to go back and go, okay, now my life is five years into a new, completely different arrangement. Uh, and or circumstance or relationship or uh, career or whatever it is and um, I should probably go back and get rid of stuff the example that comes to mind for me is um, when I was a CPA I was a CPA for 25 years and I had, you know, things around the house uh, that were about being a CPA and, you know, auditing, accounting, yuck. <laughs> Makes me shudder to think about it now, but <laughs> I had things, you really, you know, my degree was in accounting, you know, there was things about my life that were about accounting and I started doing organizing and I did an accounting job half time and organizing half time. And then I went full time and all along in there, I'm, I'm keeping up my CPA and doing the continuing education that's required to keep my CPA in good standing. Um, because I, you know, I wasn't a hundred percent sure it was going to fly and I was going to be able to make a living and la yada, yada, yada. But once I went full time, it wasn't long after that when it was like, you know what, even if I am an abject failure as an organizer and everything falls apart and I have to walk away from the clutter fairy and it, I can't eat, I starve to death. <laughs> whatever, even if that's true, and I have to go back and get an accounting job, I'm not going to go back and try to be a CPA. I'll go and do bookkeeping somewhere to keep myself afloat, and so even if I have to give up the new and go back to the old, I'm still not going to um, hang out my CPA shingle, and so I can let this go, and it was a major it was a big thing to, you know, sever after all of my um, college career and working life to agree that I didn't have to keep my CPA certificate active anymore. But it was definitely representative of leaving my old life behind and not keeping it current and in essence giving it back to the state um, was my experience of that process. And we all do that with all kinds of major changes in our life. There's some point at which you go, yeah, I either loved that old life or I hated that old life, but regardless, I'm not going back to that old life. And so then you can start shedding things related to that old life. I still have the certificate because it was hard to get. <laughs> I, I framed it back in the day and I still have the actual certificate. Um, but, you know, I, but I couldn't go back and do that now. I kept my Aristotle and Plato texts on the shelves <laughs> <laughs> for, a, for a good 15 years after I accepted that I was not going to find work as a political philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> Hope springs eternal, right? Right. <laughs> well, and I think that we, we also, we keep hoping that if we just work it out, um, some of it, we'll be able to return to something or um, the idea is still viable or we don't want to say to ourselves, yeah, we went down this path and it was a mistake. We went down this path and it was a failure. We got married to this person and it was a disaster. And it's hard to accept those paths taken and rejected, paths taken and you got punted off of them. <laughs> You know, some of the some of the paths you get knocked off against your will and some of them you choose that they were not the right path. But you accumulate those things over your lifetime and they all come with stuff. And so recognizing that those changes that have happened in your life and 
the stuff that goes with those changes can be shed is an important clutter management tool, I guess, is to recognize, okay, this has now changed about my life. And the only caveat that I would say is, you know, if you're rapidly changing, if you're in the middle of a rapid change, I'd wait a little while and see what sticks before you start throwing things out the window, right? If you're not sure, if you're trying it on for size, if you're experimenting, you know, don't give away what you think you might have to go back to or what may ultimately be your final path, but give yourself a little time to think about it. Thanks, Rowan. That was a good uh, reminder. So we were talking about the stuff being in disarray, and even if it's really organized and you can't tell where I'm finding it, and I had an example here. I spent um, yesterday, actually, working in a two-bedroom apartment where every spare space between all the pieces of furniture and inside every closet was stuffed with boxes and bags of things. Um, there are some paths to walk among the stacks to get to the couch, the desk in the office, the bedroom, but otherwise everything is stacked up and covered up and bursting. So I spent three hours in one corner of the office sorting through a mountain of bags of clothes. And so it was just sort of like a big pile that was leaning in the corner and came out into the room. There was just bags, a plastic bag on top of plastic bag on top of plastic bag that was all full of clothes. And so I spent those three hours going through and asking, you know, yes, no, about every piece that I pulled out, discarding the trash, pulling up the clothes. And underneath the mountain that was completely disguised, I had no idea it was there. I found a fold out bed in, in a love seat. It was like a love seat size, so it folded out as a twin bed. The client had completely forgotten there was a piece of furniture under there. It had been buried under bags of clothing for so long that she had forgotten it was there. So you can't use the love seat that you don't remember exists. <laughs> so in that context and for that client, that mountain of clothes was clutter and it was things that she had bought, things that she wanted, but it was a disarray and an excess of clothing and an excess, excess of shopping that was absolutely clutter in that situation. Not the least of which because it covered up an entire piece of furniture. You might define clutter as things in your life that represent decisions you can't or won't make. So what I mean here is if you're looking at objects and you can't decide what to do with it, if you can't look at it and immediately say, yes, I want that. Yes, I'm using that. Yes, this is part of my current life. And so it's not like automatically part of the active pile. And then you're looking at it and you're saying, do I want it? Do I not want it? And you can't make an, you can't make a choice there or you won't make a choice there because it feels scary. It's probably going to end up being clutter. <laughs> if you are having a hard time um, deciding what to do with it, where to store it, whether it's useful, if it can't immediately come up as part of your current life, then, and you're not wanting, you know, the, it's, implying that the answer is going to be get rid of it and you don't want to actually have to make that decision it makes you uncomfortable worried nervous afraid to let go of it then it's probably clutter and you have to get past your ability to not make the decision about it and we've talked about that in a whole bunch of other episodes so <laughs> i won't belabor that one you might define clutter as too much of a good thing so I had a client years ago who hired an interior designer. Her, her mother passed away. She, the mother lived in California and she lived in Houston. She and the designer flew out to the mother's house in California, picked all the pieces that she wanted in her house, all the things and had it shipped back to Houston. And then she paid the interior designer to integrate her mother's stuff and her stuff and all of her collections. She had all kinds of, she was a very creative, artistic person. She had all kinds of collections of things. And she tasked the interior designer with making it work. And the designer did a fabulous job. She made it work. 
and the finished house was fabulous and it was way too busy for my taste there was stuff on every surface all of the walls it was amazing to see and the house was really clean and well cared for they could use the whole house so it was all just a matter of the decor and the volume of decor and the client loved it and thought it was her dream house when it was done and i found it overwhelmingly busy to look at to be in it there was not any place that i felt i could rest my eye comfortably <laughs> and it was very artfully arranged for her it was perfect for me it was not perfect at all but it was all very artfully arranged and beautiful because someone with a very creative uh, decorative decorative eye and made it all fit in there and work but I am not kidding when I say to you every wall had all kinds of stuff all over it every surface had things artfully you know arranged across on top of in stacks around she had framed all kinds of things and hung them in every available piece of wall space and it was really overwhelming to me and from that standpoint, it was decor to my client, but it was clutter to me. And we all have a level of visual stimulus that's okay and a level that's too much. So at some point when our stuff crosses the threshold, it becomes clutter for us personally. For my client, that level of visual stimulus was okay. So it wasn't clutter to her, but for me, it was way past my threshold. And so for me, it was clutter. I have a, a similar experience. I have friends who have a lot of collections a lot and a lot of a lot of artwork and every just about every square inch of wall space is That's covered with stuff and I would you know I'm kind of a big guy and a little bit clumsy and so I would go a little crazy for fear of breaking things all the time you know, there's not even room to turn around without knocking something off a table or ledge or shelf or perch. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or shelf hanging on the wall or whatever, right? Yeah. Picture rail. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. Well, and I imagine that's what happened to the people in Victorian era too. It was like they had to very carefully move around in their rooms. Think about the clothes and the bustles that were on the back of the say, dresses. In their, and, in their very extravagant and, and overwrought clothes. And elaborate yeah. and dragging and trailing and, <laughs> and with the parasols and the hats and the feathers. And, you know, can you imagine walking through <laughs> your room and not taking stuff out on a regular basis? I'm guessing they worked really hard at it. <laughs> so um, the next, the last one we have here is um, you might define clutter as anything that causes difficulty, inconvenience, or harm to others in the household. Uh, it was actually a good segue. Uh, a good definition of clutter has to be negotiated among all of the decision-making members of a household. So this is where you have to start negotiating because what is clutter to someone else may not be clutter to you and vice versa. And what you find acceptable to live with, like all the stuff on the side of the stairs, may not work for somebody else who feels you don't feel like it's a safety hazard, but they feel like it's a safety hazard. Um, I watched a, a, a hoarder's episode one time and the house was as you would expect for one of those television shows but the piece that caught my eye was um, all of the stairs every step on the stairs had a stack of things going all the way up the stairs and so that they everyone was going down a very narrow about a 10 inch slice of stairs um, up and down and they were um, having to navigate and the wife of the person who was cluttering the house um, slipped on the stair somehow and fell and broke her ankle and so for her the stuff on the stairs was a hazard it was a safety hazard and she could not come home and live there because she couldn't maneuver on crutches in the house 
So for him, it was okay level of stuff, and he was okay with the 10 inches of the stairway. But for her, it was a hazard in, in the injury, and it was also a hazard in her recovery. And so you, while someone who is suffering from hoarding tendencies anyway, you, they're gonna, it's, negotiating with them is gonna be a harder prospect. But for the average person, um, everybody deciding what level of stuff they're going to live with and how it's going to look and how it's going to be who's at what point is it not safe for anybody in the house has to be part of the negotiation about people that are sharing space together. It's going to be something that everybody's going to have to compromise about. <laughs> somebody's going to have to live with more than they want and somebody's going to have to live with less or do more cleaning or do more straightening than they want. And there's the line in the middle that is the compromise for all people that share space. Ultimately you want it to be safe for everybody. And it's also well and, and safe and stress-free because mm -hmm. even when it's not an actual hazard, if you're living with someone who has a, lower threshold for what constitutes clutter. It's just a matter of care and respect to make sure that you're not forcing them to live with more than they can tolerate. In a really stressful way. Yeah. And, yeah. and some people, you know, if you have two people that are on two extremes of that spectrum where this person has a really, really low threshold and this one has a really, really high threshold, then, you tough. know, everybody is going to be stressed out in the, in the compromise, right? <laughs> There's the person that has to live with way above their threshold. Uh, that's, you know, you love this person and this is part of your compromise, but this, the other person is going to have to be um, cleaning and organizing and straightening way more than they would normally do. And so everybody has some version of stress about it for sure. So the uh, one more question that the person asked um, that we haven't covered yet, if initially we acquired all of those things in the first place, was there not some need for them? Why were they not initially clutter? So some of the times when we buy stuff, we actually need it, but often we just want it instead. So if I already have 200 articles of clothing, do I really need a new pair of pants? Probably not. I just want them. Maybe the new pan, you know, the new cooking pan was a bargain or it had some new feature that was appealing. So sure you have a need for some of what you bought, but some of what came home from the store was clutter as soon as it arrived. And uh, like I was describing earlier, I often find things in my clients' homes that are still in the shopping bags they came home in or in the boxes that were never opened or the shipping boxes that were never opened. I will find shipping containers from QVC where the box was never even unpacked and it's in a corner somewhere in a room and it's been completely forgotten. So if it comes home in the bag that you or the shipping container that you got it in and it never comes out, it was clutter as soon as it crossed the threshold. The minute it came in the house and you forgot about it and it wasn't important anymore, then you were just shopping for the fun of it, not because you actually needed it. Sure, it's still useful, but you bought something that you didn't need. You just bought something that you wanted. And so <clears throat> it's in that instance, it's clutter, despite the fact that it's brand new and never been used, it's clutter as soon as it comes across the threshold. If you save everything that you bring home, eventually you'll have clutter just based on the volume of the stuff in the house. So even when you stopped using something that was once useful and you're really just stashing it at this point, it becomes clutter then. So it goes from, I bought it, I needed it, I'm, I used it to, it's no longer in use, whether or not it still has some use, you're not actually using it anymore. It has now crossed the threshold and gone from, active use to clutter. <clears throat> Things that start out as useful or necessary become clutter over time as our lives evolve into the next stage of life. So that's the definition of clutter from 400 directions. <laughs> and who has questions now? Quick comment from Ginger. Okay. Who said, this is about 
clutter in relationships, which we just talked about. Mm. Our, our kitchen table where I spend a lot of time is cluttered to my husband. The area around his recliner is cluttered to me. <laughs> and so, so that, I would want to ask questions at that point. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, so that sort of touches on the, the subjectivity of the whole thing and, and that need to negotiate. And if you're okay with that little area of clutter as a concession to the other person, that's, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, you need to find a, a healthy way to talk it out and negotiate it. Well, and this is where, this is where couples get a little crisscrossed, right? So the space where you sit and work, you find that useful because you're doing stuff there. And therefore, it's not cluttered to you, and your husband's not using your space, and so it's he's not using any of that stuff, and so it's cluttered to him, vice versa. Where he sits, that's where he's actively doing stuff, and it's not cluttered to him, and it's his active zone. So everybody has their active space where they interact, process, deal with, handle, you know, whatever stuff, and it's always going to look like clutter to somebody else, and so the question is – Maybe he, I'm thinking about the dining table. If you're sitting on the dining table, maybe he doesn't like to look at that pile while he's having dinner. Or maybe you don't like to look at that pile in the living room because when your friends come over, you don't want people to look at that mess, what you think of as visual mess. So this is something where, you know, maybe you can negotiate about what is it really about the pile that bothers him? Does he not like looking at it? Does he not like it there while – can he ignore it the rest of the time, but he doesn't want to see it while dinner is happening? Um, is there some part of that specifically that bothers him? Maybe if you just made an adjustment like you put the piles of paper into a rack and put the rack on the table instead, maybe that might be more appealing to him than seeing the piles of paper on – on the counter on the surface right the or, table. Re or organize the stuff into a project box that can be you can put away. a lid on exactly yeah um he may be okay <laughs> if it all goes into a box and has a lid on it and he can't really he sees the box but not the contents um and then you can do the same thing for him like other than making erasing his presence and uh, erasing his active zone which is probably would be your ultimate wish, but then he can't get anything done. <laughs> so <laughs> then the compromise might be, how can you make it more um, visually appealing? Does he need to have a trash can right next to the chair so that he can throw things into the trash can that you can then be constantly emptying to improve the visual landscape for yourself? Or um, <clears throat> does he need a container to put some particular things in so that they're not just spread out on the surface does he need a little table or desk that can swing up and swing back you know i'd have to ask a million questions about what is it about it other than it's not yours <laughs> do you not like about it and uh, but i think that there's um, there's always compromises to be had there about ways to make it less bothersome to the non-user Tammy had a question. It's kind of a kind of a big one, which is why I wanted to save it for last. Okay. Um, she said, "How do I make quick decisions of what to let go of? Feeling scared and angry. I have a bad roach infestation in my new apartment. Living out of boxes since August. They will bomb Friday, and management is doing inspection of all units. I will have to throw things in boxes and trash bags to cover couches and clothes to protect from chemicals. I'm malnourished and eating out." daily because it's not livable when they crawl on my food. I feel shame and disgusted. So any thoughts on that? You know, what are, what are some of your, what are some of the algorithms that could work in this situation? Just the sort of the fat, what are the fastest ways to make a big difference? So the fastest things are, I would go through just with a trash bag in your hand and go looking for trash. So if it can be, if it can just be identified as trash and thrown out as trash, I would go grab it, get it in the trash and get it out of there. So that would be step one. Um, and you can do that all over the apartment. And then um, I would go back in and say, 
in t if you're just trying to get out of the way of the guys that are coming on Friday, then I would go looking for what's in the pathways where they're going to, they're going to like spray along the edges of the rooms, I guess, and spray around the cabinets and stuff. And so they're going to bring that stick in and run it along and, and, um, and deposit the chemical. So I would just make sure that they can get to all of the edges where they're likely to treat and make sure that they can spray along the kitchen cabinets and around where the fridge and the trash and the pantry are. You want to make sure that they can lay down what they want to so that it'll be an effective solution. Then you're going to end up with a bunch of dead roaches and you have to clean roaches and you know that's Nobody likes that project. That's always an unpleasant project to clean all the things away that then die because they've treated it. But that's a good, you know, you do want that end result. And so um, getting any trash out of their way, clearing the pathways to where they're going to work, I think are primary. And then if you have a lot of boxes, I mean, they're not going to generally spray out into the room. They're going to spray very targeted along edges. And so while the odor will be in the room, it, they probably won't be like getting chemicals all over everything in your house. She did say they're going to bomb, but. Oh, they're going to do yeah, the. They're gonna, so, yeah. So the bomb will definitely put a fog into the house and. Um, but it's probably, you know, if they feel like the bomb is necessary, then then I would be, um, I mean, I wouldn't want to cover up everything because you don't want them to have a place to go hide from the, like, let's get, let's get under this plastic covering and protect myself from being killed. So um, you do want it to be able, the fog to be able to permeate everything and let everything get killed off. And then worry about cleaning on the back end yeah you know, i'm thinking out loud in my yeah. head and she said i and she's trying to decide about papers kitchen bathroom closet too many cleaning products and soaps those things if it's in a you know if it's in a plastic container or you know if it's in a plastic or glass or metal container if it's as long as it's not in the way it's not a problem the the bombing isn't going to damage those things yeah she did say my cute calendar became trash the second a roach crawled on it so i guess one of the points is this is a time that you could be maybe more brutal about about if you have paper clutter get like you know get rid of all the old magazines get rid of any papers that are not essential if it's not unless it unless you really need it to document taxes or something like that this this would be a time to be a little more brutal on your clearing don't you think yeah and and if it's it's just that um you have a sort of time constraint here about between now and friday right, yeah so yeah one get get out of the way of what they're going to do and protect anything that you're concerned is going to be damaged by the fog I, in generally it's not going to hurt anything it's not going to hurt a whole bunch of things uh, you may have something in particular that you think that the surface or the treatment or the finish is going to be damaged by the fog but um i don't think a whole lot of stuff gets destroyed by those fogs i used to use those for flea treatments and um yeah they nothing, tend to be, i would not uh, walk away i came back in the house and i didn't think anything had like yeah they tend to be dissolved. neurotoxins that um are you know very toxic to to insects and then dissipate yeah. quickly um, and they dissipate in, out of the air. So I don't think it's going to destroy anything particular in your house. And and so I think you're okay from that standpoint. You don't have to worry about protecting the surfaces of everything. But um, but you do you want to make wanna it clear for people to be able to move. and. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you want to get rid of things that the roaches, um, you know, find food. And so the cardboard and the glue on uh, the boxes is attractive. Paper gets eaten a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, Adhe other than the obvious food things. Then the adhesive on envelopes yeah, is uh, that, that appealing. Glues, uh, all kinds of adhesive and sticky glue stuff. That's sort of is why I was suggesting if you've, got, if you've got junk mail 
or you know sales circulars and things like that if you've got any of that accumulated that's a that's a fairly that's kind of low hanging fruit that you could get rid of and remove a hiding place yeah i mean anything that you can um get off the floor and any kind of paper that is easy to decide and maybe you just go through and do the first pass like we talk about when we talk about paperwork get a box and in this case instead of a cardboard box get a plastic box and um throw papers in that you want to keep for whatever reason and throw out paper that you know is junk mail or trash and just to thin the volume and contain the mail just boxing it up We'll get it off the floor, get it off the counters, get it out of the way. And then if anything is, um, you know, hiding in it there, you're destroying their hiding place and um, making space for them, the fog to get everywhere it's supposed to get. Wolf on Facebook added, she should be sure to follow any instruction she has been given about the bug bomb. Oh, yeah. If, if there are anything she's been specifically told to do, which is a good point. That's a very good point. And Ginger mentioned in follow-up about her space and her husband's space we oh. manage we manage with containers oh that works okay yeah. and sometimes that's it's just a visual look right so and, and if you have containers and you know the neighbors are coming over then you can pick up the containers and put them somewhere if you want if you don't want people to be able to see them they can be the containers can be moved a lot easier than the piles of stuff right and so you've made it easy to adapt and you know move the stuff around if you need to so excellent good job <laughs> okay we are running out of time so i'm okay. going to come come back to you for a final thought but a couple of quick announcements first okay. i want to re remind our viewers and listeners that our youtube channel has more than 100 videos on a wide variety of organizing topics. You can find it at cfhou.com slash YouTube. Subscribe to our channel on YouTube and click the bell icon next to the subscribe button if you'd like to get notifications when we post something new there. Also, many thanks to our Patreon supporters. If you would like to help us with a recurring small monthly donation to fund our projects, visit cfhou.com slash Patreon. Also, our occasional reminder that you can hire Gail. You can, <laughs> if you're in the Houston area, Gail, Gail can come to your house and she will do it in a very pandemic safe manner to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. But you can also, even if you're not in the Houston area, visit cfhou.com slash virtual if you would like to book a virtual appointment with Gail that you'll meet via Zoom and you'll get a recording of your session that you can refer back to. Our next webcast will be on Tuesday, October 20th. 20th, yeah. At noon U.S. Central Time, live in Zoom and streaming on Facebook. I apologize that we don't have a topic to announce yet. We put together a bunch of ideas but we got to figure out which one we're going to deliver next and with any luck by next week we'll have uh, a little bit of a schedule of the next few weeks to announce to you okay your final thoughts gail so our lives are complicated and every day we have to make a thousand decisions about a thousand separate items so annoying right sometimes we struggle to stay on top of it all and clutter can be one of the negative effects of that struggle but if we keep a focus on the things we enjoy and the people that we love and the lives that we want for ourselves we can find the clarity to make good choices both in our day-to-day -day lives and over the longer term ultimately you get to define for yourself what clutter is based on whether the things you own fit into the life that you want to be living that's my final thoughts we love to hear from you, so please yes. keep keep sending us your questions and topic suggestions in the YouTube comments, on Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. And you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. See you next week. Bye-bye.